Deep in the Heart, written by Stacy Stallings, narrated by Becky Dowdy. This is a Brave Hearts audiobook production. Never miss a second of the story. Like and subscribe to the Stacy Stallings YouTube channel today. Chapter 13 Keith had tried every excuse he could think of to get out of going to the woodlands, but neither Dallas nor Ike would hear any of it. His future was calling, and there didn't seem like much he could do to get out of it. This house is so perfect, Dallas cooed from her side of the pickup. She looked so strange sitting there, so out of place. Keith tried not to think about who looked better sitting there. It wasn't easy. Do you think we should just put an offer in now, or should we try to haggle with them? Dallas asked. Why don't we just see the house first, and then we'll decide. Put it off. That was his motto. Put it off until the very last possible moment. It was the best he could think to do. We're going over to the stables, Maggie said to Inez Wednesday afternoon. I talked to Jeffrey. He said he would come get us and take us over there. You're going riding? Inez asked with concern. Halsies, Isabella said. I don't know. We'll see. The kids need some fresh air. There's fresh air in the backyard. Yeah, but there's not houses. Maggie shot the maid a grin. Houses. With Peter's hand in hers and Isabella planted on her hip, Maggie stepped from the gardener's truck, scanning the area for the Dodge. You want me to wait for you? Jeffrey asked. No, that's okay. If they're not here, we'll wait. He didn't look particularly pleased about that, but he nodded and drove off. In the dust cloud that followed, Maggie stepped, hoping this was the right thing to do. Maybe together they could figure out what to do about Ms. Haga and the little Marks. Holding on to both children, she walked into the breezeway of the stables where she listened with every step for voices, but heard nothing. At the door to the office, she knocked. A minute she waited, then she knocked again. Hello? Anyone here? She ducked into the office, which felt good compared with the stifling humidity of outside. Hello? Keith? Ike? Still nothing. She glanced back through the breezeway outside. No movement anywhere. Finally, she made the decision. Come on, looks like we're going to have to wait. An hour slid by as Maggie held Isabella, who played for a little while, then fell asleep. There didn't seem to be a good place to lay her down, so Maggie willed her arm not to drop off as she held the sleeping child, who got heavier by the minute. When is Keith going to get here? Peter asked, clearly losing his patience as well. Soon, I hope. At that moment, her ears picked up the voices in the breezeway, and she froze. Too late to make a new decision, she sat unmoving as the two figures walked into the office. Ike was all the way in the room before he realized she was there and stopped. His smile at her wasn't altogether happy. Ms. Montgomery, this is a surprise. She stood, praying she could get all the way up without falling. I'm sorry, we were waiting for Keith. Puzzlement ripped through Ike's gaze. Keith. Keith went to the woodlands with Dallas. Ike walked through the office to his desk as a young man, several years younger than Maggie, followed him in. At the desk, the two talked in quiet tones as Ike handed out the rest of the day's work schedule. The young man turned to go, and at the door tipped his hat to her. Ma'am? Maggie stood there, not sure if she should sit or run. She nodded to the young man who ducked out. Ms. Montgomery, why are you here? Ike leaned back in his office chair and surveyed her from head to foot. She pulled herself up to her full height. I'm, I need to talk with Keith. Keith, hmm. Well, let me give you a little piece of advice about Keith Ayer. Mr. Ayer is not available for your entertainment or your amusement, no matter what you may have been led to believe. His disdain for her dripped from the statement. Now, I don't know what fancy ideas he might have put in your head about things, but let's get one thing perfectly straight, 
shall we? He's engaged, and chasing after engaged men just doesn't make it very far on the sniff factor around here. Now, I advise you to go back up to the mansion and stay there. I don't want to see you hanging around the stables again, because you're just not welcome down here. Got it? How she kept from crying? Maggie would never know. Her pride hurt, her arm hurt, her heart hurt. Everything about her hurt, including her overwhelming desire to help the children. She wanted to tell him that, to tell him this was only about them. Instead, she resettled Isabella on her shoulder and squared her jaw. He was just like all the rest of them, condescending and spiteful. Yeah, I got it. I'm sorry for taking up your time. She grabbed Peter's hand and stumbled from the office, not knowing where she was going or how she was going to get there. Tears blurred her vision so that she wasn't sure she was even going in the right direction, but stopping wasn't an option. Out into the sun they went, through the dust, and out to the road. Her tears, hot and salty, slid down her cheeks. Ma'am! The word barely slowed her down. Ma'am, if you want a ride, I could take you the young man from the office said. Maggie yanked the tears back into her eyes and turned to him as he ran up to her. Oh, okay, thank you, that would be great. It was Friday before Keith managed to make it to the stables again. There was just something about Dallas that made him feel guilty if he wasn't entertaining her at every moment. He walked into the office at eight o'clock and grabbed the feed schedule from the wall. No doubt he was going to get ribbed for missing two days in a row. Well, the dead has arisen, Ike said as he and Tanner came into the office. Nice of you to join us again. Yeah, 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 Keith said, shrugging off the teasing. I'm going to go check the hay out in the stables. Good plan, Ike said, and waved him out. It would be good for you to get something accomplished this week. With a push out of the office, Keith strode through the stables, looking in to check each horse individually as he did every morning. He was really going to miss this morning ritual when he was chained to some desk in a few months. Good morning, Dragnet. You're up mighty early. He rubbed a hand over the chestnut's head. The office door banged, and he looked up. Y'all all ready to head out for tomorrow? Keith asked, the retreating back of the young cowboy who would presumably take his place once he was gone. Oh, Tanner spun on the heel of his boot. Mr. Ayer, I didn't see you there. Sorry, Keith came abreast of him, and they started out. Anything exciting happen while I was gone? Tanner, never one to be quick on the draw with words, hesitated. He glanced back at the office door and then swung his gaze forward again. Even as he walked, it took another long moment for him to say anything. Well, there was one thing. Nothing in Keith liked the hesitation or the glance. Why, what happened? Well, Tanner glanced back again. Mr. Jones would kill me if he knew I told you this. Well, Mr. Jones doesn't own this place. What do you say you tell me and let me decide? Well, it seemed to take a tug of his courage to get the words out. The other day, when you were gone, the lady who works at the mansion came by. The lady? Keith was having trouble picturing Patty Ann anywhere near the stables. Yeah, the young one with the nice hair. She had the two kids with her. Instantly, Keith was worried. Maggie? Maggie was here? Tanner nodded. Why, what did she want? What did she say? I don't know, Tanner shrugged, shrinking back from the weight of responsibility. Mr. Jones talked to her, and when she left, she was real upset. I think she was going to walk all the way back with them kids, but I took her back so she wouldn't have to walk. The story twisted and twined through Keith as his brain fought to decide what to do with it. You don't know what she and Mr. Jones talked about? No, sir. I just know she was real upset when I took her home. Keith nodded. Well, thanks for telling me, Tanner. You did good. I hope she's not in trouble. She really seems like a nice lady. That she is, Tanner. That she is. The Dodge pulled to the front of the mansion in a small cloud of dust. Keith hopped out and slammed the door. He stalked to the front door, 
He needed to know what was going on. Had he been thinking, he would have come up with a less intrusive way to find out. However, he wasn't thinking. Not about shoulds and protocol, anyway. His only concern was about her, and that thought overtook every other one. At the door, he didn't ring the doorbell, but he was met by Inez just the same. Where's Maggie? Inez looked positively terrified. Miss Montgomery? I think she's upstairs. Why? Keith. His father's voice rumbled through the entire mansion. I need to see you. I'm not here on business, Dad. Keith. The name was harsh and sharp. I need to see you now. Loathing for his whole insufferable life crawled through Keith. Fine, but this better be quick. He stalked to his father's office, entered, and shut the door. Something told him he didn't want the entire mansion privy to this little discussion. His father walked around the desk, but didn't sit down. I got a call this morning. Keith wasn't interested in playing cat and mouse. And? It was from Bill Hodges. He let the name hang in the air for a moment. He said somebody had canceled his contract without notice, and he said we owe him for the remainder of the contract as scheduled, whether we accept the deliveries or not. Anger boiled in Keith's gut. First of all, you told me to make a decision. I made it. Second of all, we don't owe him a dime. In fact, we paid for three loads that were either late or partial shipments. In my books, that means if anything, he owes us. Tell Bill Hodges he's off his rocker if he thinks I'm going to deal with someone who jerks me around and then says it's my fault. I'll have you know that Bill is a friend of mine. Keith was in no mood to coddle. Then I suggest you pick your friends a little better. He turned for the door. His father sounded like he was about to explode as he cleared his throat. Have you told Dallas about the other night? The other night? It took him a moment to frame the reference even as he stopped. Slowly he turned. You mean Friday? No. Why would I tell her about that? Because, Keith, you're not in college anymore, and you're not in high school. You can't go around cavorting with drunkards and expect your wife to be to never find out about it. Dad, I'm almost 30 years old. I'm not 16. I can drink if I want to. You're not hearing me, Keith. Responsible adults do not stay out all night and come home plastered. You have to get your priorities in order here. Dallas and her family can't have bad publicity over some stupid thing you did. I had a few drinks. That's not a crime. Make no mistake about this. You get stopped in the shape you were in the other night, and jail is going to look good compared to the hell you will reap from that family. And let me tell you, Lowell Henderson is not one to forgive easily when his name's at stake. Keith's patience with his father was about to run out, but he held it in two fists just the same. You don't have to tell me about Lowell Henderson. I've seen him work up close and personal. Now, if you'll excuse me. Don't you dare make a mistake with this one. His father's menacing tone snaked through Keith. Dallas deserves better. That did it. He turned in one swing. For the love of Mike, Dad, what do you want from me? Huh? What? I've done every single thing you've ever asked. Private school, college, master's degree, and now I'm marrying Dallas Henderson. I'm moving away to a house that's six times too big and ten times too expensive. I'm getting a job at a desk that I'm going to hate just so maybe, maybe you'll finally get off my back about not being good enough. And now you're going to stand there and tell me even this much isn't enough? What am I supposed to do? Cut my wrist and bleed so you'll see I'm trying to make this work? Hurt laced through him, and he hated that. I don't know why you don't just say what you're really thinking and get it over with. I'm a disappointment. I have been from day one, and if you could ship me back to the factory and order a new son, you would do it in a heartbeat. Keith, you're blowing this out of proportion. Out of proportion? Hurt snapped into raging anger. This is my life we're talking about here, Dad. 
I am sorry I'm not more rational, but I'm kind of dealing with a mountain of junk at the moment. He shook his head. I don't have to stand here and listen to this. I've decided to put Ike in charge at the stables, his father said as Keith stepped out of the door. Keith turned very, very slowly. Hurt, anger, resentment, and complete exasperation reigned through him. He wanted to scream and yell, but he knew how little that would accomplish. Finally, he shrugged. Well, it's your operation. It always has been. In two months, I'm out of here for good anyway. Do whatever you want with it. And without waiting for his father's reply, he stomped out. At the front door, he came a breath away from going out. Then he remembered his original mission, and he turned back for the stairs. Two at a time, he climbed them, not caring if it was proper or not. He didn't really care about anything at the moment. They didn't care about him. Why should he care about them? At the top, he didn't so much as pause as he headed to the playroom. When he got to the door, he stopped for one second and listened. Instantly, peace and serenity drifted through everything else. He smiled at the lilt in her voice and the happy sounds of the kids. He would have given the world to have what they had now. Quietly, he pushed open the door and peered inside. She sat in the chair with Izzy on her lap, reading. It was a scene he wished he could get very used to. Maggie, he whispered, and her head jerked up. Her eyes went wide. Keith? What? He put his finger to his lips and ducked into the room. The closer to her he got, the more his lungs screamed for air. It was like being sucked into a black hole of exhilarated anticipation. How's it going? He sat down on his heel next to the rocking chair. Unconsciously, he ran his thumb under his nose. I heard you came by the stables the other day. The depth of Maggie's agony had never reached so low. He was here, and yet he wasn't. Tears jumped into her skull, stinging everything in their path, Ike's words rang in her head, and as much as she wanted it not to be true, he was right. This was Keith Ayer, and she needed to remember that. I'm sorry, she said softly. I just thought maybe we could go riding, that's all. Keith's face fell into concern. Tanner said he thought you were upset. It took everything she had to shake her head and smile. I just thought... You know, I wasn't thinking. You have enough to do without us coming around to bother you. Bother me? What does that mean? You haven't been bothering me. I love having you all out there. That makes one of you, she thought, but she was smart enough to know voicing it would be disastrous. I know, but you have work to do. He shook his head at that, and his jaw went hard. Yeah, work. Concern plowed through her on his tone. Her gaze surveyed him. What does that mean? Nothing. He looked at her and smiled. Listen, okay, you three are welcome at the stables any time you want to come. He reached over and ran his hand down Isabella's curls. I love seeing you. Maggie nodded, but she knew better. She had seen reality in bright, living, unforgettable color. Are you sure that's all? He looked like he wanted her to say everything that was in her heart. He was so close, so unbearably close, she was afraid she just might. Yeah, what else would there be? What did you say to Maggie? Keith asked, slamming the office door behind him. He was itching for a fight, and Ike was as good a place to start as any. Maggie. Ike stood and went to the filing cabinet. I'd say you have more to worry about than some little gold digger like her. Fury overtook him in a breath, and Keith grabbed Ike by the perfectly pressed shirt and slammed him up against the wall. What did you say to her? Ike's eyes went ice cold. You're something else. You know that? You've got Dallas Henderson staying in your house, presumably in your bed, and you're all hot and bothered about some little kid's babysitter. You say one more thing like that about her, and I swear... Look, Keith. Ike pulled calm to him as he put up his hands to show he wasn't about to take the first swing. 
I know you're freaked out about the wedding. I get that. I can't say I wouldn't be either. But get serious here. You just got demoted from owner to employee, and now you're worried about this? He called already, huh? Keith backed up. The world seemed to be crashing around him. Yes, he did. I've told you he doesn't take kindly to anyone undermining him. Undermining? Whoa, now just hold it right there. You agreed with me about the Hodges thing. Yes, I did. I still do. But your dad doesn't know that, and so he will take out his displeasure on whoever's name is stamped at the bottom of the order. Besides, this way he can tell Hodges he's taken care of the problem. The word snarled around Keith's gut. Ike put his hand on Keith's back, which to Keith wasn't the smartest move anyone had ever made. Listen to me, Keith. You've got like two months left here, tops. Just lay low and keep yourself out of trouble. The less he hears from you, the better. Trust me, in two months, you'll be married and far, far away from this place and from him. None of this will even be on the table anymore. Keith turned, and the ice from Ike's eyes had descended into Keith's heart. What makes you think then will be any better than now? As far into the future as he could see, life had no prospect of getting any better than it was at this very moment. I've got hay to check. We're leaving at noon. I expect you to take care of everything while we're gone, Ike called. Yeah, Keith walked out. What else is new? Sitting at the counter over a ham sandwich and chips, Keith reran the morning through his mind. Ike had said something to her. Of that, Keith had no doubt. But what had he said? How low had he sunk to convince her to stay away? His thoughts traveled back to the party on Monday. Tracy cut Maggie to ribbons, and Maggie never so much as swung back. He wondered if that's what she was doing now ducking back and hoping to become invisible so no one would see how hurt she really was. The thought sent an ache through his heart that he wondered if he'd ever before felt. She was hurting, and there wasn't one single solitary thing he could see to do about it. Hey, babe, Della said, coming in from the garage with a fistful of packages. I didn't expect you to be here. Lunchtime. She thunked the packages onto the counter. Oh, hey, Dad called today. He's got an interview set up for you in two weeks with Mr. Farrell at Devonshire. He said to emphasize your education and to go easy on the last five years. Dallas walked up and ate a chip from Keith's plate. What else did he say? Just that he and Mom will be coming up to Vermont again for graduation. You are remembering graduation, aren't you? May 13. You've got your flight booked and everything. She ate another chip. He hadn't even thought about it. Oh, I was going to do that this week. She didn't look pleased with the answer. You need to get that booked. You're going to have to pay triple if you wait too long. Like she'd ever thought money was a problem for him before. Or, I guess you could take your dad's private plane up there. That thought seemed to appeal to her as she crunched another chip. That way, we could just fly back together. Yeah, why don't you just do that? Yeah, why didn't he? This has been Deep in the Heart, written by Stacy Stallings. Narrated by Becky Doughty of Brave Hearts Audiobook Productions. Copyright 2010 by Stacy Stallings. Production Copyright 2014 by Stacy Stallings. What's coming next? Find out, like, and subscribe to the Stacy Stallings YouTube channel and never miss a second of the story.